Our next speaker is Christian Williams from the University of California, Riverside, and he will be talking about native type theory. Whenever you're ready, Christian. All right, thanks. Hello, my name is Christian Williams. I'm a PhD student of John Baez at UC Riverside, and today I'm presenting native type theory, which is joint work with Mike Stay. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I think it's great that Categories and Companions is a conference by and for grad students. I think we definitely need more of that, that kind of community engagement. So I thought I would start with um, my a little background as a grad student of how I came to, uh, came to study this topic. Um, so I came to grad school when I was excited about the movement toward a decentralized internet um, and the belief that it'll be vital to a uh, a stable future. So I came to John Baez saying that I wanted to apply category theory to blockchain. And he said, I know nothing about that. I have absolutely no idea what that is. Um, but he said, oh, I recently got an email about that exact thing. Uh, and so he connected me with this company called Statebox, uh, which is doing some really cool stuff, applying category theory to design languages and software for blockchain. And in a roundabout way, this led to a collaboration with Greg Meredith uh, at another blockchain company called Rchain, along with Mike Stay, who is a past student of John Baez. And they had been uh, thinking for a long time about the question of how to generate logics for languages um, automatically or generally. And so I talked with them and struggled for this, struggled with this question for a long time. And in retrospect, the solution uh, was much simpler than we thought. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And this topic of native type theory is going to be my thesis direction um, over the next year or two. And although it's very simple, and some would say the ideas of it are not um, original, they're, they're very simple ideas that have been around, I'm actually really happy that this idea is simple. Uh, because I think that its application can can have a real impact, and that's that's what I care about. So here is the spiel that I plan to give to programmers and computer scientists um, when we try to actually start implementing this idea. Uh, type theory is growing as a guiding philosophy in the design of programming languages, but in practice, many popular languages do not have well-structured type systems. They had other priorities in their design and they suffice for many applications. But uh, as many of us here would agree, type systems can only improve uh, reasoning and control and communication of systems built in these languages. So ideally, there ought to be a way for a language to generate a type system in a, in a systematic, uh, methodical way. And the idea is that categorical logic provides a method to generate a native type system uh, of any language for reasoning about the structure and behavior of programs. And the hope is that this could provide a unified framework of reasoning for a broad class of programming languages. So the, the whole idea of native type theory is as follows. A language can be modeled by a category with enough structure that you need. So for us, it will be products, internal HOMs, and finite limits. And such a category embeds into a pre-sheaf topos, uh, which is just a much richer structure. And this embedding preserves uh, the structure that you needed to define this, this theory. And the internal logic of this topos is the native type system of the language, um, which can be understood as an enhanced version of your original language. So that's really the whole idea of native type theory. It's, it's very simple, but it's very nice and natural from a, from a categorical point of view. And in particular, uh, the construction is functorial uh, so that translations between languages induce translations between type systems. So if you have some kind of compiler that's translating between languages, it'll also carry over this higher order reasoning. 
So the main theorem of our paper is that there is a two functor from our class of theories to uh, a two category of higher order dependent type theories. Um, so as a little outline of the talk, um, I'll sketch the kind of theories that we are considering, um, which encapsulate a um, surprising amount of existing programming languages, um, and then talk about the language of a topos, um, which is a very, very rich structure, and then uh, go through a couple of applications. So uh, as many of you may have heard before, the language of Cartesian closed categories is simply typed lambda calculus. This is the language of products and functions. So anytime that you're thinking about algebraic structures that involve operations, and those operations might also be higher order, meaning they might take in uh, function spaces or internal homs, you are working in some kind of Cartesian closed category. The class of theories that we are considering in this paper are what we call a lambda theory with equality, which would be a Cartesian closed category with pullbacks. Um, and this extra bit of structure um, adds to the lambda calculus um, indexed sorts. So there are these structures called generalized algebraic theories, uh, which are equivalent to finite limit theories that allow for sorts to be indexed um, by variables. And the example there to keep in mind is that the theory of categories is an example where the HOM in a category is a sort indexed by pairs of objects. And the operation of composition depends on matching up those indices. So these are the, uh, the class of languages that we're considering. You might wonder why we chose this level of generality. Um, why not go ahead and um, consider like locally Cartesian closed categories? Basically, the answer is that most programming languages don't have dependent types. And so adding that level of complexity um, would just scare away people. Um, but uh, that, is, that is another option here. The idea of, of this construction is not tied to this exact level of generality. So our running example in the paper is a concurrent language called the row calculus. If you've ever heard of the pi calculus, this is um, similar. It's um, a little bit more refined. And we chose it because it's kind of like a simple language where you can still get very rich examples of these native types. So you don't need to understand everything here. Um, the basic idea is that in a concurrent language, um, programs, rather than being a sequence of instructions, they are multi-sets of parallel processes. And the way that uh, computation progresses in such a language is a rule called communication. And what it says is if you have two parallel processes that are inputting and outputting on the same channel, then, uh, then some data can be passed uh, through through this channel. Um, that's really just the whole engine of this language. So if you don't remember anything else uh, about this language, just remember this, this communication rule. Uh, one thing you might be wondering is what is this arrow here? Um, if we're just in plain old one categories, how do we have rewrites between terms? Uh, this was a very clever idea that Mike had um, about putting rewrites into languages. Uh, anytime you have um, a diagram that you don't really want to be an equation and you would like to have some kind of rewrite between them, you can just add a sort called edges with source and target to, to your sort of terms. And you say that the source of your edge is one side of the diagram and the target is the other side. It's a very simple and clever way of like putting a ghost arrow, a ghost uh, two, two morphism into, uh, into a theory. And this turns out to be very expressive 
in fact, it's more expressive than uh, using two categories or enriched categories to put rewrites into theories. Uh, and I can talk more about why later. Um, but this leads to the idea that native type theory will reason about not only the structure of programs, but it can also reason about the behavior of programs. And doing both simultaneously is what we think is the most new and exciting thing about, about native type theory. Could I interrupt with a question, sure. please? In the, in the syntax for this row calculus, what do the P and the N and at the end the E represent? Yes, yes. So P stands for processes. Yes, sorry, I should say this. And, and N stands for names. Um, it's following the, the terminology of the Pi calculus. You think of the names as channels um, that you can communicate over and the processes as the, as the programs. E is just E is just the sort of rewrites or edges. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. All right. So this, um, given such a language, we can embed it into a pre-sheaf topos um, using the Yoneda embedding. You know, one of the most important constructions in all of category theory. So in our case, it would send a sort to essentially the index set of all terms of that sort or all programs of that sort. And you could picture that as like the giant tree of all of all operations into a certain sort. And a, essentially what native type theory does is that it just provides a language to carve out subtrees uh, of this. So uh, yeah, the this embedding preserves the limits and internal HOMs, the structure that we need to define our kind of higher order theories, and embeds into a very rich uh, category. So the category of presheaves is a topos um, whose subobject classifier sends a sort to the set of subfunctors of its representable. And these are the subtrees that I mentioned. Um, they're, they're equivalent to these things called sieves um, that are subtrees closed under pre-composition. Um, in the same way that predicates form a Boolean algebra, um, the subobject classifier of a topos is always an internal complete hiding algebra. And so this defines a very important functor from a topos to complete hiding algebras that sends any object to this lattice of predicates on that object. And this determines a, a nice category sitting over your topos called the predicate vibration. So the fiber over each object is, is this lattice of predicates. This is a very nice structure, very rich structure. And in particular, it's something called a higher order vibration, meaning that it has um, adjoints to uh, to substitution or precomposition, and you can think of these as direct image, pre-image, and secure image. So, given given a predicate on an object A, um, you could push it forward using direct image, or given a predicate on B, you could pull it back using pre-image. Then there's also this extra right adjoint that people don't talk about as much that performs an interesting and refined operation. Um, so altogether, this is a, is a very expressive structure for, for constructing predicates. So as some quick examples, uh, I'm, I'm kind of running low on time, but um, so the, the simplest thing to start doing is you generate basic predicates using your operations. So for example, the nullary, the do nothing process in the row calculus generates a predicate where you just close it under pre-composition and it's just all processes that factor through that operation. And using that with the um, lattice structure and the in this direct image, we could form a predicate for single threaded processes, for example. This is, these are processes that are not zero and they're not the parallel of two things that are not zero. This is like a number being prime. It's not the unit and it's not the product of two things that are non-units. Um, 
So that's an example of a, of a predicate. Similarly, uh, instead of direct image, we could use pre-image. So given any predicate, um, we, could pull, we could pull back along an operation to say, okay, give me all pairs or whatever, such that when I apply this operation, it satisfies a predicate. Um, so that's also very useful. And then an example that demonstrates uh, the difference between these two kinds of images um, can be found in the paper. Uh, I want to I want to try to stay on time. So um, the predicate vibration um, is very nice. It sits inside a larger structure called the codomain vibration, where um, a predicate corresponds to a subobject, and we can consider more generally that any morphism in a topos can be understood as a dependent type where the canonical example is just a function can be thought of as an indexed set. Um, so we're doing that in category of uh, pre-sheaves. So these two vibrations, together they represent predicate logic in a topos and dependent type theory in a topos. And they're connected by an adjunction where you can turn a predicate um, you, you can comprehend a predicate and turn it into the set of things that satisfies it, and vice versa, you could take a dependent type and take an image factorization to turn it into a predicate. Um, but the point is that altogether, um, these, this forms what is called a higher order dependent type theory. So if you want to learn more about this stuff, it's all in Jakob's um, big book called Categorical Logic and Type Theory. It's definitely, the mo it's not an easy read, but it's the most comprehensive reference about all of this stuff. Um, so we take a theory and we take pre-sheaves on it. And then we consider this pair of vibrations that, that thinks about predicates on those pre-sheaves and dependent types on those pre-sheaves. And that's it, that's the whole, that's the whole construction. So the, this construction that sends a topos to its internal language uh, defines a two-functor from toposes to higher order dependent type theories. And what's interesting about this is that every, a lot of people talk about the fact that toposes have an internal language, but uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of material about the functoriality of that construction. I'm not sure why. Um, so I think there are actually a lot of interesting open questions about about this construction. So um, as, as an example application, um, in the row calculus, we had um, a basic rule of communication uh, that two parallel processes um, can communicate a message. And from this, you can generate this, there's this huge graph uh, where the vertices are programs and the rewrites are communications. And using native types, you can filter to subgraphs. Um, so you could take a network running this language and you say, I want to restrict to communications uh, on a certain type of channel alpha, sending a certain type of channel psi and continuing in a certain type of context. Um, I didn't have time to talk about this, but it's like a dependent hom saying a, a context so that when you receive a certain type of data, you continue as a certain type of program that depends on that data. Um, so this is very expressive. Um, it's allowing you to, to have a fine-grained uh, specification of, of computations happening on a network. And moreover, uh, you can construct modalities not only on the main graph, but, but on subspaces such as these. The other quick example of an application is what I'm calling refined binding. In any language where you have a binding operation, um, where it involves plugging something into a function, nor by default, you don't have any say over what uh, will be plugged in to that function. Uh, so for example, in the, in the row calculus, you have this input 
it's going to accept anything that comes down that channel. It has no say about it. Uh, but using native types, you could um, refine that operation to say, I'm only going to accept uh, data on the channel uh, that satisfies a certain condition. So native types allows us to do this. And um, this is really nice because that such a condition could be a predicate on structured data, it could be a set of trusted addresses, or it could be like the implementations of an algorithm. So this restricted input can be understood as a query for some kind of data. And um, the way I like to think about this is that Google uh, or most search engines uh, search by fairly surface level predicates. You know, they search by keywords or something. Uh, this is a search uh, that is deep. It, it, you can search by arbitrary predicates on structure and behavior. So you, in theory, you could go on GitHub and search, give me um, all programs implementing the following algorithm subject to the following security conditions. Obviously, that might take a very long time to get to that point, but, but that's the idea. So, um, so to be honest, uh, Mike and I have not really mapped out the scope of the applications yet. We're not sure what, what the scope is, but it seems very broad. Um, but there seem to be two main categories of applications. Uh, on the one hand, you can debug and condition and query existing code bases. But on the other hand, you can also think of a native type system as a richer programming language. And you can write new code um, that can significantly expand software capability. So we're excited about both of those applications and the fact that most of the tools necessary for implementation already exist. So if you're interested in, in this, uh, please feel free to contact us. And you can find all the relevant references uh, in the paper. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Join me in thanking him.